in terms of like producing content and what we're putting out to the world, what I put in the book, I, there's kind of three main buckets that you need to be thinking about to be efficient. What I found is you can make such a tremendous impact on a business and a productivity of an organization just by cleaning up just those three buckets. And what happens is when everyone is kind of doing whatever is best for them in the moment, everyone loses. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, bud. All right, so you, you, you're a lazy little person. Um, you, underachievers. A how way I like underachiever, to yeah. yeah. Columnist in Entrepreneur Magazine, um, Inc. Inc. Magazine. So, that's right, sorry, I apologize. Inc. Guest lecturer at Columbia University, founder and CEO of Leverage. I've used Leverage before, so great company. You know, you just, you just do a lot, and now you're writing a book because you obviously had free time. And I yeah. want to jump straight into the book because you've always been about systems growth, making it easier for the entrepreneur to actually expand themselves. Why did you write the book now? I had so much free time and I was restless. <laughs> I just didn't know what to do with myself. So I was just like, what, what's a good way I can fill all this free time? Because I just got everything off my plate, everything automated, everything's just so easy, you know? Uh, no. I wrote the book because firsthand, I know what it's like to be drowning in work. And that's why I called it Come Up for Air because I've drowned in work. I, everyone that I talk to and it's like, how's it going? So many people, especially during the pandemic, you know, their first thing is I'm drowning in work. And uh, I, didn't, I wanna help people. I wanna spread the message. And I've, I feel like I cracked the code on how teams should operate to their highest and best use in leverage systems and tools in smart ways. And, you know, my quick story, my quick, quick story is early days leverage, we scaled very quickly. We got ahead of our skis. We grew to seven figures in the first year, 150 team members, but we grew way prematurely. And one day my business partner at the time tapped me on the shoulder, says he's leaving, not in two weeks or two days, he's leaving in two minutes. And it was tough. At that point, we were a freelancer marketplace and we had the really smart org chart of he was people facing, I was non-people facing. So at the time he left, we had almost a million dollars of debt, losing tons of money. And in the coming months after he left, we lose about 40% of revenue. I'm cashing out my 401k. My dad's taking a second mortgage on his house to make payroll. Um, and it was tough. I was drowning and I had to make a decision. Do I bankrupt the company or do I try to turn this around? And I saw, I, I saw a path to turning it around. I knew where we were missing some big opportunities to be more efficient and operate smarter. And I stuck it through and actually quite quickly it turned around and I started realizing if you use these tools in the right way, which just hasn't been defined or taught before, you could really get you know, in some cases, 50 to 100% out of certain employees of yours. I mean, the amount of waste happening with employees was crazy. And so very quickly, things started turning around. And also, I got referrals and people started reaching out, asking me to help them with their businesses. And it was anywhere from a small financial advisor up to Poopery or Tony Robbins or some Fortune 10 tech companies. And everyone was drowning and everyone had very similar needs. And so Ultimately, we pivoted leverage to being an operational efficiency training and consulting company. And I decided to write the book because it didn't matter industry or size. Everyone was benefiting equally from this framework that we developed. And when you think about it, there's tools like Slack and Asana and email and all these things. No one's ever been taught when or how to best use these. You get thrown into a company and it's like sink or swim. And I just wanted to give people this call it for lack of a better word, a better, a, an employee manual that's not covering health insurance and vacation days. But hey, this is the language we speak. If you want to be successful working together, read this book, get on the same page with how to work together and let's get it done and not have a scavenger hunt. All right. So we don't want to wait until the end. Where is the best place for them to find this book? So we, we developed a website called comeupforair.com. From there, you could find all the links to buy the book, but also we put together, I don't know, 50 to 100 pages of additional free resources that you can download. I mean, 
HarperCollins is my publisher. It's a 320 page book, no fluff. It's like the playbook. If you read this, you will run efficiently. And, you know, I'm an efficiency geek and it's 320 pages. If I weren't, this would have been like a 1400 page book. And so we couldn't fit any more into the book. HarperCollins didn't want it any longer. So what we did was we threw this, we put a lot of time into the website and the content is world-class that you can get for free on the website too. No, 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 there is no technical difficulty here, but I am jumping in to give you a PSA. If you like what you're hearing, if it's helping you, if it's benefiting you, I just want to let you know that there may be other ways I can help you. Jump over to stevedsims.com, learn about my speakeasies, learn about my Sims distillery, my coaching, any way that can help you. But again, if it helps you, great. If not, then listen to this podcast and at minimum action what you're doing. Anyway, I'm going to get you back to your usual showing. Enjoy the rest of the show. Bye for now. All right, we're going to put the link to the website as well. So you've already you've already heard it. We're going to put it in the show notes so you can follow up. Now, the thing that the thing about you, there's a couple of things. For one, you're used to working in a stressful situation. You were a trader on Wall Street. You've just yeah. openly turned around and said that your partner left. We both know him. Yeah. He left your company, surrounded yourself with debt. And but you've always been quite a mellow kind of systems kind of guy. That kind of systems and analytical mindset doesn't go hand in hand with being able to handle the freewheeling, out of control stress that you've yeah. been in, both in an old career and in this. How do you manage to keep both uh, both feet into both sandpits? Because these are two mindsets. Well, you know, for one, we have that in common, right? We both worked in finance in Hong Kong, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> My career was shorter than yours, though. <laughs> I, I mean, lucky. I love I, I love your story about finance <laughs> in Hong Kong. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I always used to think my unique ability was math. I did well in math and did, you know, fancy degrees in that. But I, as I got older, I realized that my real talent is I just have a crazy high pain tolerance. You know, I just don't tap out. But also, like you, I just figure shit out. Can we cuss on this? I'm guessing we can. I, I'm, I'm sure we can. can. Yeah, yeah, go yeah, for yeah, it. yeah. I mean, it's well, me. No, so, uh, so I think similar to you, you know, you got this like figure it out muscle. You know, you're you're getting people to the Vatican. You're getting people. You're getting like, uh, 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 what's his name, Andre uh, Bocelli, oh, Bocelli to yeah. sing. And, you, you know, you're doing crazy stuff because you're you just know that you will be resourceful and figure it out. And I think at my core, I've never let myself down in terms of. I can put myself in an uncomfortable position. I'm I'm quite confident that I have the survival skills to figure out and work my way out of a bad situation. And I just have a, a high pain tolerance, I guess. Now, I remember when, when I was first introduced to Leverage, you guys actually threw all these names out. You mentioned Asana, Trello, Slack. You know, it seems as though every week, there's a new tool that's bright and shiny that's going to, to to make all of our lives easier and it's just laying on top of the old one. So yeah, yeah. how do you actually see these new environments for what they are, adopt the ones you want and ignore the other ones? How do you actually so, see through all of that noise coming at you? I think it's easy to get caught up in this space with uh, shiny object syndrome yeah. and, you know, you know, you find a, oh, look at this new cool thing that's like a button that can do blah, blah, blah. Like at the end of the day, you can't be managing hundreds of new tools. So I'm not even looking for new stuff anymore, to be honest. Like, sure, we're we're playing around with things, of course, because that's kind of our job. But in terms of like producing content and what we're putting out to the world, what I put in the book, I, there's kind of three main buckets that you need to be thinking about to be efficient. You've got your communications bucket, your planning bucket, you know, tasks and projects, and then you've got resources, SOPs, processes, intellectual property. And what I found and what's the core of the book is no matter the size of the industry, those are the three buckets. And I try to not get, get people distracted beyond that. Of course, if they're asking me, what are my thoughts on this? I'll share. But what I found is you can make such a tremendous impact on a business and a productivity of an organization just 
by cleaning up just those three buckets. And, you know, even within those buckets, you've got email and you've got like Slack and Teams. You've got, so there's still four or five, six different tools required to be successful with those buckets. But I don't want to, I don't want to overwhelm people and start giving them hundreds of different ideas and tools, you know, just focus on these four or five things. It's going to take time to change behavior and get used to that anyway. Um, and there's, uh, there's pushback that people give even with that they they'll say, well, why is that more efficient than just using text and email? And that's a pretty common piece of pushback, but these three buckets, CPR, which, you know, is you know, you, you're a branding expert, CPR come up for air. You know, we tried keeping everything consistent here. Um, it, what was I saying? Those buckets are just so critical to the foundations of your productivity. And these, there's different tools that are built to solve specific problems that are so common in those different buckets. And so if you went camping in the forest and you had to chop down a tree, you could use a Swiss army knife, but you'd rather have a chainsaw to chop down the tree. So even though it's an extra tool, it's built for purpose that people have invested lots of money researching to build the perfect chainsaw for the purpose of cutting down a tree. Likewise, in business, you're communicating all the time with your team. So there's tools that have literally, people have poured billions of dollars building out internal communication platforms with specific functionality to make it easier for you to do this thing that you do day in and day out. Same with managing your tasks and projects. It's such a common thing and need in business. Why hack it with the wrong tool when someone's poured billions of dollars putting functionality into, into something where you can click a button and answer the exact question you want to answer? So there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a course of tools that we talk about in the book, but we're not you know, trying to overwhelm people with hundreds of different things. You've always been an efficient an efficiency guy. And that's the thing I've noticed about you. You've always gone, well, look, this looks good. Yeah, great, brilliant, but it's effective at this. And I will, yeah. I will, you know, give credit to that as I say, I've worked with leverage. I know the boys, so I'm vouching from here, yeah, you know, publicly. Um, but you've always been about, okay, what tool works best for you? Now you say about speaking with the team, a lot of business focus on that communication with their clients. They actually ignore the communication with that team and think, oh, sending a text or doing the occasional Vox or something like that, that's good enough, but let's focus on the CRM with our clients. And then they lose the communication within that team. Do you see that more often than not within corporations? What I see in all corporations is people get over in general as a general thing, and I'll just generalize it. People get people are completely overwhelmed, drowning in work. And when that happens, you start just trying to cut corners to survive and you play this game of hot potato. And so what happens if you're already working 80 hours a week or 60 hours a week and you can barely keep up, you're just going to do whatever's easiest for you in the moment. It might be a text to your colleague asking them to do something, you know, write a blog for you by Friday. It might mean that you're not properly updating that CRM with notes of the of the call that you just did because you're now on a back to back call and you forget later because you're too, you know, you're you're too overbooked. And so what ends up happening when people get overwhelmed and they start cutting corners is they're optimizing just to get stuff off their plate. And what happens is when everyone is kind of doing whatever is best for them in the moment, everyone loses. And so the underlying premise with, with my book and my philosophy is you need to be optimizing and setting up systems and processes to retrieve information rather than transfer information. And it's, it's really the core principle of everything that I talk about. It's, are you optimizing for retrieval? Meaning, are you globally optimizing your process and your strategy for the team versus the individual? And so... Uh, when it comes to CRMs, like you need to use all these tools, right? If you're customer facing, one of the most popular things that we're doing right now, Steve, is we're teaching people how to use Gmail and Outlook. If you can get to inbox zero in those tools, because you might be listening right now and maybe you've never heard of Slack or Asana, or maybe you use it, but you hated it. And most likely you hated it because you just didn't use it right. And it wasn't rolled out right. And it wasn't properly taught to you. What's the purpose of this tool? Like under what situation should I even think to open up that tool what problem does it solve and so if you're not taught these things they can hurt your productivity versus helping and 
not everyone uses them, but email, whether no matter what you do, you're using Gmail or Outlook. So one of the one of the quickest ways to save time is just learn how to get to inbox zero. Not only will it save you time, but I guarantee I've just seen I've seen millions of dollars of missed emails. Like literally, it's like, oh, holy crap, I can't believe that I missed that email. That's some massive deal that, you know, just because I don't have a good way of keeping track of my email. So there's money sitting in your inbox right now. And there's just a lot of wasted time. And especially if you're client facing, if you're not if you're not properly using email, you're doing a disservice to yourself and to your team. Now, I've actually been with you when you've actually taught the Inbox Zero strategy. Mm -hmm. So for those people that are listening to this and they've heard you mention it a few more times, go through what it actually means, how it works, and, and what you teach yeah. on the Inbox Zero. So first, first, you need to know what is email? How do, how do you think about email? When should you use it? So what we teach is email is just a to-do list that other people can add to. It's a communications platform that you should primarily be using with external people like clients or vendors, people outside of your organization. It should not be used to be a project management tool. You know, Asking me to write a blog by Friday, it's not easy to hold me accountable. You can't click a button and email and know what's everything that I asked Nick to do this week that got done versus didn't get done. You know, So there's a difference between communication tools and some of these other tools, and that's what I talk about in the book. But once you can wrap your head about when to use it, so external communication, and then reframing in your mind what it is, it's just this to-do list that other people can add to. Well, now we can start talking about this, you know, this, this thing that we call inbox zero, which you may or may not have heard of, which basically just means you've got less than 20 or 30 emails in your inbox. Now, when I tell that to people, they think that I'm crazy and, you know, you might have 50,000 emails in your inbox. Uh, you know, uh, some people that I've recently uh, spoken to, they had 200,000 emails in their inbox. And just by reading the book, they immediately got down to below 50,000 within an hour. And then they followed the rest of it and got, got it down to zero. But basically, you, you shouldn't be looking at your email and every single time you get an email, you need to deal with it. But as long as you have a grip on it, as long as you have control and you're not wasting time, things aren't slipping through the cracks, you're not wasting time Relooking at the same stuff, less than 20 or 30 in your inbox. And every email that comes in, there's only three things you can do with it. You can reply, you can archive, and you can defer. And so the system we talk about in the book is RAD, reply, archive, defer. Most people don't even know what defer is. There's a magic button that's a clock icon in Gmail or in Outlook. You have it on the web app or you can install Boomerang, but essentially, you can click a button and an email can leave your inbox and come back to the top of your inbox whenever you want. So if you're talking to a potential client and if they don't reply to you in a week, you want it to come back to the top of your inbox, you can write to someone, click the snooze button, have it come back in a week. Or you're going to the Vatican and you've got instructions on what to do you know, the day of. Maybe you don't need that for the next six months, but a few days before you want that email to pop back up because you want to reread it. So, you know, how are you going to do that if you're not snoozing it? You don't want to just be keeping it in your inbox and having to scroll or search. Maybe there's a hundred messages that have been back and forth regarding the Vatican. So reply, archive, defer. You don't need too many folders. You can just use the search. And then there's some, you know, there's some systems, tricks and tips in the settings. But other than that, if you just followed what we just talked about, that's all you need. Now, we've got this big shiny object coming at us at the moment, AI and chat GPT, everybody yeah. and their mum knows about it. Yeah. I can't help thinking that the future isn't going to get quieter. It's going to get noisier with shiny objects. What do you see coming at us that is possibly going to take people's attention that shouldn't? I repeat the last part what am i seeing that what what are you seeing coming that is going to take people's attention that shouldn't and let me explain that a little bit more again based on the shiny object syndrome we see things we go oh i gotta have that it's like the people that buy a new iphone every single year that it comes out yet it really hasn't changed anything so what yeah. do you think people are paying attention yeah. too much to 
Yeah, I think that they think that this is going to replace all of their staff and solve world problems. And I think it's a tool <laughs> that I think it can help. I think it can definitely it's a it's a tool. It's an add on. It's not a replacement. Like I I think it's something that your writer can use to maybe pump out some more articles. Um, and I think it's really what I see it right now in its current form. It seems like it's really good for you know, you have an idea, you want some ideas for titles, you want, you know, I just had a book come out, you know, if you want, what's cool is you could copy and paste all the reviews and say, write me five more example reviews that, you know, based off of what, you know, 38 uh, other reviews have been written, give me five examples of what another review might look like for this book and it, stuff like that. But it's not going to call a client for you and close a deal or help you with pricing or product market fit or all these things. I think it could just help you cut a few corners in terms of writing. I mean, right now, chat GPT doesn't have data beyond 2021. Maybe yeah. that will change in the future. I personally, I mean, we all think our own stuff is the best, right? So I personally think that it, there's no magic pill to being more productive and the only way to like really solve the productivity problem in companies is the CPR framework that I'm talking about. But you should be aware of these additional tools because time is time. If if that tool can save you a minute here, an hour there, even if it's not every day or every week, I mean, say, save whatever you can save. But I think you have to be, you have to just be clear what problem you're trying to solve. Sometimes people... I try to create problems. And what's that famous phrase with blockchain? It's a great solution. We just don't know the problem that we need to solve with it yet. So <laughs> it's kind of kind of like this too. Like get really clear on what you want it to you, what you need to use it for. But I think this thing is going to integrate into your knowledge base. So instead of asking someone, you know, tying it into my content, you know, I, I talk about how important it is to have this company wiki. Well, Maybe at some point you can ask a chat GPT bot that's connected to your wiki and you can ask it questions about stuff and it can go in a smart way and look look up an answer for you to rather than you going through the wiki. Um, I could see it being integrated with email. So, you know, write me an email back to Steve thanking him for being on his podcast. You know, and these things might save me a minute or five minutes and that's, that's cool. Um, I... It's hard to predict where it's going, but yeah, in five years, maybe it's just doing some really crazy stuff and it's going to completely transform how we all work. I think for the next year or two, it's going to be a, like a nice to have, but I don't, I don't see it. I don't know. Some people are talking about this, like they're going to cut 90% of their staff and replace it with chat GPT. I just don't see that happening. I think we're actually going to get um, desensitized to that kind of engagement. I think we're going to be, at the moment, we're like, oh, look, look at this. This was done yeah. by, by ChatGPT, but not by you. So we're like, well, you didn't put any effort into it. So we're going to start seeing, like I've already s started seeing people that didn't write big emails, did not write blogs, did not write articles. Yeah, suddenly we've got like 10 articles a week and you just go, Hey, I know that's not you. I know yeah. you've now got a guy that's got great prompts and great button awareness on chat GPT, but it's not you. And at the end of the day, you're saying it. And I do want to draw attention to it. Are These are it? tools. Uh, do you know, I did actually write, I used it to write a script and yeah. I did use it to write a homepage of a new challenge that I'm doing. And I that? found I found that both of those were really good, especially with the prompts. But they were to me like a tailor made suit. You had to finish yeah. it off yourself, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think yeah. that's where people are missing out on that bit. I wrote this script. I wrote this um, this copy for the for the website, and then I finished it. And I think that's where people are missing it off. They they're like, oh, this this is good. Yeah, it's good. But it ain't you. Your imperfections are what tell people yeah. this is a human being communicating with another human being. And on that point, I think that's our biggest problem. Chat GPT is perfect. We're not. 
And I think that's what's going to catch people out in the end. Well, you know what? One thing that you can do too, did when you when you asked it to write that, did you say and do it in my voice? And did you upload you can upload example um articles and blogs that you've written so it can learn your voice and then you could say, Here's my voice. Now write me something, you know, in that in that tone. So you could also maybe I haven't tried this, but you say, you know, and I want it to only be 99% spelled correctly or pr correct grammar. Maybe you could even say purposely mess up the grammar. So I actually, uh, I work with Roland Frazier as, as one of my coaches and Roland was actually walking me through these different prompts and yeah. we actually did that. So you oh, can really? actually, you can actually <laughs> go in there and it's, it's comical, but if you think you are like someone, you can actually say, write it in their voice like for argument's sake you're a writer you're also a lecturer so there's a lot of paperwork out there and articles me you know me i don't like writing long things so there's not a great deal of of um asset out there of what well, i've done before but, but you're a speaker there's tons of content of there's, you speaking. actually there is that i never thought of that but we, when i was dealing with roland roland said try and think of a famous character that's got your kind of style and sarcasm and things like that. So we wrote this page. It looked pretty good. We flushed it through chat GPT to correct it, make it sound good. And then when it was finished and bearing in mind, that takes three seconds for it to be done. We put in there now, write the above in the voice of Ricky Gervais. <laughs> And it was brilliant. So <laughs> you can actually, you can yeah. pick a character that That's you smart. think you're similar to. And yeah. it was, it was, it was exceptional. Right. So we actually got the front page. I wonder if you could though. What? I wonder if you could take some of your, some of your talks, transcribe it, and then just upload the transcription as, as yeah. the thing to learn, right? Yeah, you you absolutely could. I do you know I never ever thought of taking my speeches. You know, I was always thinking it's got to be an article, it's got to be a letter, it's got to be you know document something like. But you're right, you could take a transcription of some of your favorite speeches, uh, you know, Genius Network or something like that, and just upload those. So that's a good one there. So, Nick, I've already endorsed you. I've already told people they got to go and get okay. his book. You're a sharp lad. Um, again, where can they find out about this book and where can they get that inf uh, that extra assets from? So th first of all, thank you for having me. I always love catching up with you. Uh, comeupforair.com is everything related to the book. If you need any help with the training and you want to go a bit beyond the book, getleverage.com is the training and consulting company that we run. Nick, you're a star. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, bud. Hey, I hope you liked that episode of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast. And remember, these are done for you. If you like them, subscribe, share them around. But if you don't like them, send me an email to ask at stevedsims.com and you can tell me what I need to do to make this the most dynamic podcast you listen to. Anyway, make sure whatever you learned from the last podcast you actually do something with. Without action, it's just a bunch of people blowing air. Have a good time. Until next time. Bye.